Oh my God, it's been way too long. I know I've neglected you guys, my my faithful tripod listening audience. I'm here. It's a beautiful spring day as I record this. I just watched Judge Judy. You guys know, like, that's my jam. If anything's going to get me really ready for a show, it's watching Judge Judy. She's my power animal. Ate lunch, so I'm all ready. Like, I am rearing to go for this episode, and I am so excited to talk about what I'm going to talk about today. Well, what is that? Well, I am going to talk about one thing that I really love, SEO, and I brought a guest in to talk about something that she really loves and knows a lot about, which is SEM. Now, you may be saying to yourself, I don't understand SEO and SEM. You're going to understand by the end of this episode. You're listening to Tripod, a podcast produced by Tricycle Creative to help safely navigate creative business owners through the worlds of digital marketing, strategic content creation, and business growth. Host Ross Erosion is a marketing coach, content creator, and entrepreneur who brings you helpful tips, social media updates, inspiring interviews, and his own unique perspective on how to tell your story and grow your business. So if you're interested in being a better marketer, business owner, or creator, sit back, relax, and let's get pedaling. So my guest today, and really, I think probably most, maybe more appropriately even receive a co-host, because we're going to be shouldering, equally shouldering the weight here, is Jill Saskin-Gales. Jill, hello. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Yeah, I'm super excited. I've been looking forward to this. I'm, you know, we, I always joke that really most of my podcasts are like the least produced show ever, but we have put in a good amount of planning to to really outline what we're going to talk about today. And that is, I think it's kind of like the Venn diagram of SEO and SEM, right? Like where they're different and where they are the same. Absolutely. And, And I think where it makes sense for the solopreneur, small business marketer, and I think also there's a lot of things when it comes to SEM that I say, and it was so, I'll say reassuring when we talked to hear a, a lot of the same things that I've been saying. It like, it like, it's like, okay, great. From an, from an expert. So this made me feel really, really good. Do, do you want to start with just talking a little bit about maybe your background? Absolutely. So I am a proud Canadian, live in Toronto, and I run my own digital marketing consultancy. And the reason I'm able to do that is because I worked at Google for six years, left Google in, oh gosh, almost a year ago, April 2021, to start my own business because I really saw, you know, at Google, I got to work with the world's largest and most sophisticated advertisers, the kind of businesses that spend millions of dollars a year, if not a million dollars a day on Google ads. And that's great and wonderful and loved what I got to do there. But I saw this big gap where all the small business owners and entrepreneurs out there just couldn't get a foothold in, not because Google ads isn't designed for them, it absolutely is, but because there just wasn't a lot of information and help out there for the people who have maybe 20 or $30 a day to spend on Google ads instead. (laughs) And so that's why I really focused my business. Uh, I'm the Google pro on TikTok and Instagram. And I just love sharing tips on how to get the most out of Google ads, of course, and also free Google tools. And the number one thing I say to people as someone who makes a living from SEM is start with SEO first. (laughs) So really excited to (laughs) dive into this conversation today with an SEO expert like yourself. As an SEO person, that made me so happy when we talked about that. I was just like, oh, God, not just because it reaffirms what I've been saying, but because I truly think that that is the right order of operations. I'm, I'm really keyed in on, particularly with a lot of uh, my clients, they come to me and it's a lot of they don't know what they don't know when it comes to digital marketing. And so I'm really big on kind of, you know, even digital order of operations. Like this is, you should do this and then this and then this and then this, because if you do it in this order, you'll save money. But also these things, they, you get compounding interest, Yes. right? If you do your branding first and then your website and then you're like, like the, having done those exercises in a particular order gives you tremendous benefit. Now. 
That's a side tangent. Let's put that on the shelf for now. So let's, I'm going to start with the most obvious statement, maybe I'll say in this show, but it is, um, uh, if you're listening, you should want to be and need to be on Google. And what does that mean? Well, we're going to be talking about that because how you get on Google is two different ways, SEO and SEM. And, and I pulled up some quick stats. Right, I, I I know a lot of you. Even Jill, when we were ta- when we were planning, she's like, "Do people really need to understand like that they need to be on Google?" And I'm just gonna say, let's just do this real quick because I want to hammer it home that it is something of importance. In fact, I actually argue doing work to get on Google is better than doing work on social media. But again, side tangent, whatever. Okay, Google controls. Here are some quick, quick, quick facts. Google controls over 91% of the global search engine market. 91%. It's actually 91.8. Let's round up. 92%. So yes, there are competitors entering the space, but Google still has a 90 percentile ownership over the global search engine market. Nearly 35% of product searches in the world start on Google. Right? It's the place that when you're looking for a product, third of them go to Google first. And Google, unsurprisingly, is the most visited website in December 2021. Google was visited 89.3 billion times. That's a lot of visits. Second only to my MySpace page, which is still really yeah, doing well. So us. I hope if you guys, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks. I'm really working. I love the marching ants I find is what brings people into my account. And I really always, you got to always change up your top eight. This is just, oh, wait, this isn't the my, let's put, again, forget that. All right. So let's talk a little bit. I think the first place to start is difference between SEO and SEM. I'll start with SEO. And then you can talk about SEM just at a real high level, right? SEO is organic. And what that means is it's a non-paid or non-advertising. It's not that you obviously, you may need to pay people to do it, but just to understand, this is a non-advertising method to increase the overall traffic from, we're going to say Google for the sake of this conversation, from Google. And, And the key there is that you not only increase the quantity but that you increase the quality, right? Relevancy is incredibly important. I say this with my clients where if you just want to increase the volume, you know, and you're a website that sells roller skates and you're driving a lot of people to your website who who want to buy ice cream, that's not a useful improvement, right? So, So relevancy and volume are incredibly important when it comes to SEO. So now I'm going to hand the baton to Jill. Jill, how is, she just got it. How is SEM different? So SEM, search engine marketing, is when you pay to show your business and your website on Google. And that can often be conflated with PPC, another term that gets thrown around. So PPC means pay-per-click, and that's any kind of digital advertising where you're paying for a click, something like Facebook ads or LinkedIn ads or TikTok ads or Google ads, whatever it might be. And then SEM is a specific kind of PPC that's focused on search engines like Google or Bing or others, like Baidu if you're in China, uh, and focusing on using money as a shortcut to get your business to the top of search results. And so the first thing I say where people often get confused, right, is thinking that like, oh, well, if I pay Google for ads, that's going to help my SEO. And so I just want to say from a former Googler, that is absolutely not true. What actually happens at Google is behind the scenes, the system that operates all the SEO and organic rankings is a totally separate system from what organizes Google ads and all of that. To us as end users, it's just one page and we think, well, of course, one influences the other, but they're actually totally separate systems behind the scenes. The reason that often people who have a really great and strong 
SEO presence will also have a great strong SEM presence is because a lot of the same principles lead to success with both. Like you were mentioning, Ross, relevance, having highly relevant ads to what people are searching for will help your SEO and your SEM. But no, you cannot pay Google to have better SEO. You can pay an SEO expert to help you with your SEO. You can pay Google with Google ads to have great SEM but they are independently operated systems. So I just want to get that out of the way first thing. And that's another piece that I talk with my SEO clients about so that they understand that. And yes, while Google falls under the alphabet umbrella, corporate umbrella, if you will, those two, I'll say machines or even platforms of organic and paid, I would imagine they are incredibly different right? And that they don't see each other because people do come in like, well, maybe if I do, again, just like you said, if I do paid, that's going to help my SEO. And and so I think that's a really great myth bust, first myth bust that we did. Now, the second thing I want to hit on just right off the top is another misconception around SEM that Google ads are just placed because someone pays the most. They could just go to the highest bidder. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that one also is absolutely not true. And that's really the beauty of Google and why Google became this multi-billion dollar company is the concept of ad rank. So historically, the way advertising had worked was like an auction, whoever pays the most wins, great. But the way that Google ads actually worked is based on a concept called ad rank. And ad rank, where your ad shows on the page, depends on two things, your bid, how much you're willing to pay, but also your quality. Both are taken into account for ad rank. And what's so cool about that is the higher your quality, the less you have to pay to show an ad. So the person who gets the first ad result doesn't necessarily have to pay more than person two. They may be paying more, but they may not be. And so Google Ads really is or can be this great equalizer because you don't have to have a multi-million dollar budget in order to show your business at the top of the paid search results. One of the reasons I think it's so powerful. So quality score, I think, is one of those things that's a little bit shrouded in some mystery, right? And, and understandably, it's the, it's a secret sauce to some extent. But I think there are things that we do know about it. Are there some high level things that we know impact quality score? Yes, there are. So the full algorithmic workings of quality score are a black box, just the way the full algorithmic workings of SEO are a black box. Or the full algorithmic workings of Facebook's algorithm or Instagram exactly. or so forth. Yeah, that's their secret sauce. It's their 11 herbs and spices that they keep in a vault somewhere. But what Google does tell us are three key components of quality score. And actually, when you run Google ads, Google search ads specifically, you can actually see how you're doing on each of these three components. Uh, So the most important is expected click-through rate. Click-through rate meaning of all the times your ad shows, how often do people click on it? And that's kind of the best barometer of quality. Google's like, if we're going to show your ad to people, are they actually going to click on it? Because, of course, Google only makes money if people click on ads. So Google wants people to click on ads. And then you as a business only get website traffic if people click on your ads, which is what you want. And then even users, as much as we'll be, I don't click on ads. I don't like ads. Like, of course, we want ads that are more relevant to us and not ones that are irrelevant to us. And this is what's interesting. Everyone out there listening, when you understand that this is not just about you're getting served this ad because someone paid the most, that this is actually being delivered to you, yes, because someone is paying, but also because it is highly relevant, I think you become more apt and open to clicking on ads and thinking that, oh, this is just junk, right? Like it was transformative for me when I learned years ago a little bit more about how Google ads work to be like, okay, I don't need to be ashamed, scared or whatever to jump over those top three ad results or the top five or whatever. Because a lot of times, they are incredibly relevant to my search. Right. And if they're incredibly relevant, you're going to click on them. And so that's why that's the most important component of quality score is expected click-through rate. So that's number one. Number two is something called ad relevance. And so that just means is the thing the person's searching for related to your ad, like if they're searching for ice cream, does your ad mention ice cream? And then does your landing page mention ice cream? Because of course, Google is the one who has these, you know, 89 billion visits in the month of December 2021. When you're placing ads, you're really saying, Google, take your customers and give them to me. 
And so before Google's going to hand off that precious traffic to you, it wants to know, are they going to have a relevant experience or are they going to land on your website, say this is actually a website for roller skates, and then come back to Google again and go look for another result, which a user does not want to do that. They want to just find what they're looking for. And that's a bad user experience. And Google does not want to create an environment where their users have a bad experience because then what happens? They leave. So Google is incentivized to make ads incredibly relevant to your search, not just give them to the highest bidder. I said that's and that's exactly why quality score is so important and why it's not just bid. And I'll mention just quickly the third piece. So click through rate, ad relevance, and the third component of quality score is landing page experience. So part of your ad rank has to actually do with how fast your website loads, if it's mobile optimized, if it has original content, or if it's just been some AI generated garbage. So like that, your landing page itself, nothing to do with your keyword or your ad, that's actually a component of your quality score and affects how much you will need to pay per click in order to get people to click on your ads. The flip side of all of this, right, is about the um, return on investment, if you will, that I, as a someone running Google Ads, would get. So I think the third and final just very common misconception I w- want to talk about is that ads are, you know, the easy shortcut to revenue. Wish that it were true. <laughs> yeah, right? We all do. So, So, again, just one... In your experience, you know, particularly thinking about the the, the 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 small business owner who may be listening to this and want to run Google Ads, you know, and we'll do more of this throughout the entirety of this episode. But expectation setting when it comes to or revenue and, and how that relates to or return on investment and how that relates to Google Ads. Yes, yeah, so ads are an easy shortcut to traffic, and as I mentioned earlier, traffic does not mean revenue. Now, if you're getting the right kind of traffic, you know, you have great targeting, the right keywords, the right audiences, then you are going to bring in traffic that is more likely to convert. But it's still your website's job to take that traffic and turn it into customers, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And so that's why I always say paid should follow organic, whether we're talking about Facebook ads or Google ads. It's like if the people who come to your website from SEO organically from Google aren't converting, then people who come when you pay money aren't going to magically start converting. That's why you need to make sure you have a well-converting website. You want to look at your conversion rate from direct traffic and from Google organic traffic. And generally, you know, general rule of thumb, I would say you want a conversion rate of at least like bare, bare, bare minimum 1%, ideally more like two to 5% before you even consider spending money on ads. Because ads are not a shortcut to revenue, they're a shortcut to traffic. Your website has to convert traffic to revenue. Now, can your ads work and try to optimize towards conversions? Like, sure, you'll then feed that data back to Google Ads to say who converted and who didn't. But at the end of the day, Google can learn from that and change the kind of traffic it sends your way. But it's still just sending you traffic. It's not sending you revenue. I always, you know, I think this is... One very important way of framing, uh, I think, a lot of ads, and, and it's always that the, the gray space between marketing and sales or marketing even in conversion is that marketing creates opportunity and sales creates revenue. And when we're talking about that as it relates to ads, um, you know, uh, it's not a client that I ever ended up working with, not shockingly, but I've had many who come to me and they have a god awful website. And instead of wanting to invest in SEO or invest in a new website, they want to do Google ads. And it's just the garbage in, garbage out is, sorry, guys, but you need to hear it. If your website is bad and your copy is not relevant to your target audiences and you don't have, you know, again, relevant pages that you're driving traffic to with consistent messaging, no amount of ads are going to fix that. I mean, maybe unless it is boner pills or Can't advertise those. um, <laughs> got them. 
But it's actually not boner pills, but what you were just saying before that, it's actually um, a lesson I learned the hard way. When I first left Google and started my business, I was so idealistic. You know, I'm here to help small business owners get up and running with Google ads. And the first two clients I worked with, both female solo entrepreneurs, great small businesses, ran Google ads for them, ROI negative on both. And I'm admitting that here. And it hurt my heart. And I was so upset and doubting myself. And it's like, I forgot this cardinal rule because when I work with these giant corporations, they have this figured out already. But when I looked at it, I saw, oh, it's not that the Google ads didn't work for these two small business owners. It's that their websites aren't working. And so all I did by running Google ads for them was drive more people into a broken website. And I felt really terribly about it. And so I ended up helping both of them try to improve their website a bit, but still said, you know what? come back to me when your conversion rate is 2%. And to this day for both of those businesses, it's still not there. And so neither of them are running ads. And I have learned from that. And as a result, have said no to so many business owners, but please don't run ads. Don't hire me. (laughs) Yeah, guys, this is important. A huge piece of what I do and the guests I bring on this show and the things I talk to you about are so that you have the necessary, accurate information to make decisions. And, and so this is important for you to hear, again, that there really is no silver bullet that applies to all businesses, right? And, and I think a lot of people look at ads that way and, and even to some extent maybe other aspects of digital marketing. And every case is going to be very different. And, you know, marketing – I had a, a fellow agency owner colleague once say to me, like, marketing doesn't answer questions, it illuminates them. Mm. And I think it's very true. And that's the thing. That's what always drew me towards digital marketing and even content creation was the constant analysis. And here's how we can improve. Here's what worked. Here's what didn't work. Now here's what we need to do, right? Like it's, it's a constantly evolving type thing. And with that, I think it's a good time for maybe us to talk about the actual how the strategies work a little bit more. You've you've already done a great job of talking a little bit. We're going to pull the curtain back a little bit more. I'm going to talk about how SEO works at a really high level. We're going to talk about SEM, how it works. And we'll be back right after this. Understanding who your customers are, their FFPs, fears, frustrations, and problems, and why they should work with you are just some of the questions that I answer inside of my Marketing Clarity Coaching Program. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here's what a recent graduate of the program had to say. The Marketing Clarity Program was by far the best investment I made in my business this year, if not in just the life of my business. When I hired Ross, I had no idea who my ideal client was. I had tried those exercises before where you figure out your customer avatar, and it just never worked. What Ross helped me do was figure out who I should be marketing to, how to figure out what their pain points and frustrations are, and how I can best serve them. He also helped me figure out my voice, how to bring my voice, and how to bring my personality into my messaging and into my content, which is something I lacked for a very long time. Weekly in our calls, the exercises we went through were invaluable. They were easy, but also powerful. He made it feel super simple and also just gave me the ability to take everything we learned and put it into this toolbox that I can refer to anytime I'm making content or I'm about to send an email or post to my website. In fact, one of the weeks when we were working together, I immediately jumped off our call and sent out an email taking what he had taught me. And right away, I signed a new client just from that one little tip. This has been one of the best experiences of my life. And I highly recommend the Marketing Clarity Program for you and your business. That's Craig Dacey, a financial coach who helps service-based business owners struggling to pay themselves what they're worth by providing systems and guidance for better money management that leads to the ideal work-life balance. He's a friend of Tricycle Creative, and you can find him over at craigdacy.com. It's D-A-C-Y, craigdacy.com. He's just one of the dozens of solopreneurs and small business marketers that have had their marketing and their businesses transformed by my Marketing Clarity Coaching Program. So if you're walking around in a marketing fog, let's book some time, see if I can help. Go to tricycle-creative.com slash clarity. Again, that's tricycle-creative.com slash clarity. I'll put the link 
in this episode description. And it's always over on our show notes page at tripodpodcast.com. And let's book your 15 minute clarity call. All right, guys, we're back. And now what I wanted to do is, again, talk about the two strategies that are at kind of a high level. You know, we talked about SEO. The way I approach SEO is that it is both a blend of content and technical, right? I think particularly now, since even the Google algorithm and AI has become so much smarter in the past six to nine months, as we sit here recording this in March 2022, it's become so much smarter to understand context and relationships and language that SEO is no longer just about, I'm just going to put this keyword on this page 20 times and that's going to get me to the top. It's like, run, don't walk away from any SEO person that recommends that. That is not good. It doesn't work anymore. It, it, Google's smarter than that. Okay. I think, it, you know, SEO is really about creating relevant, informative, valuable content related to your business, you know, and what your business does. There's a big, there's kind of a tenet inside of SEO that talks about creating content that establishes the EAT, E-A-T, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. You know, there is a technical side though. With technical, it's about metadata. You meant Jill mentioned before site speed. That is a factor on both. So if your site is loading slow, so you're probably asking, what's slow? Jill, would you say slow is definitely longer than two seconds? Yeah. What do you, what's your is that is that a kind of a good general benchmark? When I first started at Google in 2015, I would have said five seconds. By 2018, yeah. I would have said three seconds. And now I would say like one and a half to two seconds, anything longer is slow. Yeah. Yeah, what's called the like the first content coming in, you know, in that, in the, within that first second. So they're not looking at a blank page. Maybe something's coming in, all the element, other elements kind of fall into place. But yeah, I think two seconds because you know, fast is a subjective term. I think it's important that we say if it's if your site's loading in over two seconds, particularly on mobile, right? But I think in both situations, you need to look into getting that fixed and. That's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, and even now, the evolution of Google getting smarter with what's called core web vitals. Weirdly enough, design can now even play a part in SEO. And it's how design actually impacts functionality. That's really where this, this thing that's called core web vitals comes in. And, and with SEO, the thing is, you, you, it's an ongoing thing. I don't take on any clients for less than six months at all, right? It's just ridiculous to do SEO for shorter than that. I usually recommend a year that someone work it for a year. It's a, uh, I look at it like much of marketing, but as an investment and you get what I call compounding interest. So when you do SEO, you start to see your rankings improve. You start to see your site go up. You start to see your site traffic go up. You start to see these signals that SEO is working, impressions on search, so on and so forth. You can continue to get those if you do stop doing SEO. Not forever, mind you. But if you keep working it, you get, again, this compounding interest concept where you get added benefit over time. So that's SEO. Jill, let's talk about that flip side or have you talk about that flip side with SEM. Yeah, to build on your compounding interest analogy there, I say SEO is like being a homeowner and SEM is like being a renter. Oh, I love that. So with SEO, you like buy the house and it's a fixer upper because that's all you can afford. And over time you renovate and build and work it up. And then you have this wonderful house to live in. And if you don't maintain it, it could fall into disrepair. But like you have that equity. You're a homeowner. Uh, SEM, you just like slap down a security deposit and like, boom, you're in. And as long as you pay your rent every month, you have somewhere to live. But the moment you stop paying, you get evicted. <laughs> There's no long-term benefit there. I love it. Yeah. So that's how I think about it. Like being a homeowner or a renter. I'm going to borrow that, <laughs> i.e. steal that because it's so good. Go it's so it. on, on, on Go the nose. Go for it. Yeah. So with SEM, as we talked about earlier, the thing that matters the most is your ad rank. And so what you're willing to pay does matter. You know, clicks don't cost a cent. 
anymore. They cost $2 to $5, can be as high as $20, even higher than that, depending on your industry. But the better your quality, the more relevant your ads are to what a user is searching for, the less you have to pay. And the basic structure of search engine marketing is really like any other kind of digital marketing. You can have various campaigns. And within those campaigns, you have keywords and ads. Or actually with machine learning, you don't always have to have keywords nowadays. But for simplicity's mm -hmm. sake, you have keywords, which are specific terms that are relevant to your business that you want to advertise on. And then billions of people come to Google search every day around the world. They type their query into that search bar. And if there's a match between their query and your keyword, you're eligible to show your ad. So are hundreds of other advertisers. So you have to win that auction by having a high enough ad rank. But if you do, you're eligible to show them an ad and then hopefully they click on it. And that's how search engine, it's like really complicated and really simple all at the same time. And when we talk about Google ads, we often think of search engine marketing. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Google ads is not just SEM. There's also display and discovery and video and app campaigns and the new Performance Max campaigns, which combines everything into one. So search is like the foundation and in most use cases where I suggest people start with Google Ads. But then there are lots of other ways to expand your reach or improve your efficiency or both with formats beyond search ads within Google Ads. I have a question for you. As a pro, as an expert, someone who, who lives inside of Google Ads, right? What is your take on the, the move, it seems, for a lot of Google Ads moving towards automation, AI? I think it's tricky because to the layman's person who just comes in, the small business owner, like, oh, great. You know, oh, okay, I, I, get, I, I have to click less. I have to know less. I have to do less. And I kind of just leave it up to Google's, you know, AI and the machine learning. But I, I read some things that that actually is very difficult because AI requires so much more data to actually deliver results. So do you have a take as someone who lives in there as versus like kind of like the more, I'll say, curated or handmade <laughs> Google ads versus the automation? I do. Actually, that was the topic of a monthly meet I just hosted a few days ago. Um, I have my own learning platform called Inside Google Ads for small business owners who want to learn about Google Ads. And part of that is a monthly meet, a monthly Google meet, of course. And the topic this month was this, is automation your friend or foe? And this is a place where as someone who worked at Google, my perspective is very different than most other PPC experts out there. This is where I get the vitriol on Twitter. Because I fundamentally sure. um, believe in the power of automation and that Google intends its automation to do good things for business. But understandably, those who haven't worked at Google or don't share that same blind optimism around Google as I do, see a more sinister cash grab. Google's just trying to push us towards automation to make more money for Google. So I will say, when you think about automation, kind of the way I broke it down earlier this week, there are three main ways to leverage automation within Google Ads. There's automating your bidding. So rather than choosing, I want to pay this much for this click and this much for that click, letting Google take care of bidding. For the most part, I'm a huge proponent of that. I think it saves time. I think it's great. There's automation of your targeting, which I alluded to earlier. Do you pick your own keywords or does Google pick them for you? Do you pick your own audiences or does Google pick them for you? And that's where small business owners can be at a disadvantage because, to your point, Ross, the systems need more data on what kind of targeting works in order for them to work well. So something like dynamic search ads, which is where you don't pick your keywords. Instead, Google Ads just looks at your website, figures out the right queries for you and does it for you. Interesting. Um, that only works if your website is already optimized to do well in an SEO environment. Sure. If your website doesn't do well with SEO... It's not going to do well with dynamic search ads in SEM. And that for audience data, so that's things like, do you have a large customer list of data that you can share with Google? If so, it's going to be able to go out and find more customers better for you. But if you don't have a large enough list, you're not eligible for that feature. Sure. So with targeting, in theory, it absolutely works better than manual every time if 
you have enough data, which many small business owners don't. And so for small business owners, my advice is to test and see. And that's true, guys out there, that's true of any ads. I don't care where you're running it. Television, the newspaper, Facebook, Instagram, Google, guy on the sidewalk spinning a sign. You need to test, see what works. Maybe that sign spinner is getting more people talk to him during lunch hour. Okay, don't have them out there in the early parts of the morning, right? Like everything related to ads. And even by extension, most aspects of digital marketing, which is the beauty of digital marketing that you at least get data. I recognize it can be drinking from a fire hose, but you have data to make informed decisions. And I want to say this, you, you, you brought up, I think, a very common thing, not only in marketing and not only in ads and not only it's in life that it needs to be either or that the truth or, or the outcome can't maybe be that both are true. And for me, it sounds like it is very conceivable that two things can be true. Increased automation can be better for the person running the ads and make Google more money. Yes, those don't need to, like the the incentives are aligned. As we saw earlier with the way ad rank works and the way quality score works, like the incentives of business owners and Google, like, are more aligned than they are not. I'm not going to sit here and say it's perfect and hunky-dory all the time, but they are more aligned than unaligned, more in common than not in common. And um, and I've seen, you know, the way automation can just make a Google Ads account print money, mm. just the money printing machine. And the key, though, with automation, that doesn't mean that humans don't have a job anymore. You know, <laughs> automation does exactly what you tell it to do, nothing more nothing less. So it really changes our jobs, whether you're a marketer or a business owner or kind of a hybrid of the two, you need to understand how the automation works and what it's doing and what new directions you can try to push it in. It's really what we call higher value work. I think it's more interesting work and it allows all this creativity to to come into what's normally a very quantitative space. So I'd say automated bidding for the most part, excellent. Automated targeting can be great, but can have drawbacks. Um, the third piece of automation, which is where I'm most skeptical for now, <laughs> okay. is automated creative. Yeah. Automated creative. yeah. So responsive ads, I'm a full fan of. I know mm-hmm. most PPC experts out there hate them. I love them. I think it's great. Great. And a responsive ad just means rather than designing an ad to exist exactly the same for every single user, you give Google ads a few different headlines, a few different descriptions, a few different images. And it plays Tetris, kind of mixing and matching to different best combinations. You kind of give it the ingredients, exactly. right? You give it the ingredients and then it can make different recipes, if you will. Depending on the user. So that absolutely great. But that still requires you, a thinking human, to create the text, to come up with the images, to create the videos. Now, there's more and more automation coming in to take that off your hands. Sometimes results good, sometimes not as good. So that's a place where... Um, I am, automation does the least right now, but like the direction we're going in, it's going to take care of that. And so the one piece of advice I'll give you to keep in mind is when you are creating your ads, again, whether it's for Google or something else, what you think is the best line of copy is not necessarily going to be the same copy that drives the best results. So when you run these tests, Google ads will tell you exactly which headlines and descriptions are working and which aren't. Don't try to tell Google, well, you're wrong. That can't be low performing. That's my best one. Like, it is purely looking at what are people Put clicking on. Put your pride and not. on what the shelf, creative. Yeah. yeah. So, so the feedback you get from the automation is great. But for now, humans still have to be the ones to write the text, design the images, et cetera. So, those are kind of the three. That's how I look at it, at least the three pillars of automation. All are useful all are taking over more and more and more. And I see that as a good thing. Work with the automation and figure out how to make it work for you. Don't just bury your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist because there will come a point where there is no manual option. We're seeing that happening more and more each year. So guys, you just learned a ton about how these actual strategies work. So to wrap up this episode, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about which one is right for your business. 
It's Tripod, the Trace School Creative Podcast. Hey, Steve. Oh, hey, David. What are you up to? I just got back from the doctor. And you're excited? Well, you know how recently I've been confused about my marketing? Yeah. Well, I've been unable to conduct simple marketing tasks. Plus, I have this persistent anxiety about posting on social media. I told this to the doctor, and he said I have MAP. MAP? What's that? Marketing Analysis Paralysis. It affects most creative business owners and in some cases can even lead to business failure. Oh man, but it seems like you're not worried about that happening to you. Yeah, the doctor gave me this pamphlet. Marketing Clarity Coaching Program by Tricycle Creative? Yep, they have this 10-week intensive coaching program where they can help me better define my customers, build my brand identity, and when it's over, I'll have hundreds of content ideas and opportunities. So obviously you're going to do it, right? Yeah, I've been putting this off for too long. I'm going to head over to GetMarketingClarity.com right now and book my 15-minute call. GetMarketingClarity.com? I think I'll head over there too. Man, have we learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Jill, thank you so much for being here. You know, I I don't know. I think as someone who's a marketing coach and I guess you, you, a teacher, you know, I, 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 I'm voraciously curious. So this is why having subject matter experts like you on this show are so incredibly helpful because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm honest with my clients. They're like, I know a lot about a lot, but I am... I don't live inside of all these platforms all the time. I mean, I pretty much have cut Facebook out of my life. Like I don't use it personally, but I can still train and coach and I'm in there enough so that I'm not, you know, teaching this antiquated guidance. But, you know, Google ads was something that years ago, it was a service I was offering. But as a business owner myself, I wanted to start to gravitate towards the things I think that I did best and that I love doing. And, and that really tied into marketing strategy and marketing coaching. So I just want to say, as we come up and talk about this last time, just how thankful I am that, that you're here. And thank you so much for sharing your, your, thank your expertise. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I feel the same way. You know, when I worked at Google, I thought I knew it all. And then when I left Google, I realized how much I still had to learn and how much I've learned over the last year. <laughs> and my business has also really evolved yeah. into coaching and teaching is what I do most now because there's so many misconceptions out there about Google. And I'm not here to be a Google yeah. shill to help Google. Google does not need my help. <laughs> I'm here to help small business owners and entrepreneurs who only ever see the side of digital marketing experts that say, here's the hack to Google doesn't want you to know. And here's the trick. And here's how Google's it. trying to cheat. I you. hate it. And I find that so toxic and I unproductive. Like if I'm a business owner and I think Google's trying to cheat me, what, what use is that to me? You know? And so I just, I enjoy bringing this different perspective of showing like, here's how to make it work for your business because shocker google only succeeds if the business owners who use google succeed also not for nothing i mean listen there there are hacks and whatnot which i you'll never see me ever put out a hack or anything like that i talk about tips and strategies right but you're probably not going to totally trick google i'm gonna, I'm gonna get a million dollars out of google and they're not gonna know like it's just just relax, guys. Like, it, that's probably no offense. You're not that Probably special. not you. None of us are that so, special. So, let's... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'm not. You're not. It's okay. We're all special in our own ways, but that ain't it. So, SEO, SEM, which one is right for your business, right? And, um, you know, of course, as I said before, there is no silver bullet per se, but I think that we can speak very broadly and in our own experiences um, generally about what's kind of a good path uh, to at least consider if you're out there listening and thinking about these two strategies. You said it already. I'm going to double down on it. Your recommendation, as is mine, is that anyone that's looking to kind of get involved and go all, rewind all the way back to get on Google more or better is to start with SEO, organic. Yes, Absolutely. I always talk about that's kind of, it builds the foundation. It's a playground. I use this with Facebook and Google. It's like, we, we, we need to get your kind of playground in order, right? So that we can have people come in or your park or whatever it may be. We need to get this piece of land in order because if people come into your playground and you have broken glass on the slides and drug dealers hanging out, all like, it's just not an optimal place. And just like you said, you're not going to want to send one person to it. You're not going to want to send 50 people to it. 
right? So we need to get that kind of that that in 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 good foundational like order, working order. Everything is functioning properly. Where you know you you again are creating and have created relevant content that speaks to your current and prospective audiences, your customers, that kind of thing. You know, st- typically it's a page should follow organic across the board, right? And I think when we're talking about cost and expectations, you know, I talked about this already. SEO, you should be prepared to at least invest or go in for about six months. Strategy should oftentimes include uh, an initial site optimization, monitoring, content creation, and backlinking. Those are kind of big tenets of SEO. And for me, and this is just me, right? But, you know, my cost for this, what I call the done for you SEO service is you're looking at around $2,000 a month. Like that's mine. I'm not going to say that other people out there don't do it cheaper. I'm not going to say other people out there don't offer some variations. That is the cost to do all of that stuff in a way that makes an impact, right? So again, I think it's very important. I actually had someone inside of my marketing clarity community this past week um, (laughs) praise how transparent I am. So uh, I'm going to walk that line right now and just... and. You know, put that out there so you understand the costs uh, in going into this. Now, do you want to talk a little bit about like expectations when it comes to costs uh, for SEM, yes. Joe? So on the SEM side, the, once someone decides, okay, I'm ready to spend money on ads, well, how much do I need to spend? So let's say the bare, 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 bare minimum is $20 a day for at least 30 days. So a $600 investment. Now that $20 a day for 30 days is if you are a local business with very specific narrow keywords, then okay, $20 a day for 30 days. If you are trying to sell towels across the whole US, that ain't going to cut it. (laughs) Or insurance. Or insurance, exactly. Where cost (laughs) per clicks can be $80 or, you know, per click. Uh, Definitely not. But just bare minimum, smallest to small businesses, $20 a day, likely more. If you're not sure... You can actually create a Google Ads account without spending a dime. And within Google Ads, there's a tool called Keyword Planner. And so Keyword Planner is really useful to look at. Even if you don't know what keywords you want to use, you can just put your website in. It'll suggest some keywords. That's how you know if your SEO is good, by the way. If those keywords that come back are relevant, Mm. good SEO. If they're not so relevant, go work on your SEO before you buy ads. But anyway, look at those keywords and then pick the geographic area you want to target, whether it's U.S., a state, a city, whatever. And it'll tell you the average cost per click for one click. So you can figure out from there, you're probably going to want to drive, what, at least 10 clicks per day from an ad. You're going to want to release 30 days. That'll give you a ballpark of how much you need to spend. And then you want to know, can your business support running ads? Are you ready to run ads? And so the really simple equation I tell any business to figure out ballpark finger in the air, are you ready to run ads, is looking at your conversion rate and your average order value. So let's say your conversion rate on your website is, I don't know, 2%, um, and your average order value is uh, $100, let's say. Multiply those two numbers together. That'll be $2 in our example here, and that gives you your revenue per session. Meaning on average, every time someone lands on your website, how much money do you make given your downstream conversion rates? And that initial number, if you're going to run search ads, you want that initial revenue per session number to be at least $2. Like the cheapest clicks you can reasonably expect would be $2 cost per click. So if it's going to cost you $2 to bring someone to your website, you want to know that you're making at least $2 whenever someone lands on your website, ideally more than that so you have some profit. But again, just as a ballpark, any business can do it exercise, look at your conversion rate and your average order value, multiply them together, and you want that to be at least $2 if you're going to run ads. If you're not in the e-commerce space and you're more like services, how do I do that? Then just look at your conversion rate to someone filling out your form or contacting you. And then from there, how many of those convert into customers And then from there, how much you make on average per customer. A few extra steps of math for you, but you can do the same exercise that way. If that number is like $2 or less, you're not running to run ads yet. You need to work on improving your conversion rate 
or your average order value or both first? This has been, I hope you guys have really got a lot out of this. So obviously, I am biased to say if you are in the market for SEO, you should hit me up. Now, they'll be in our show notes. We're going to have all this information. We have all kinds of stuff. Tripodpodcast.com to grab the show notes. And I'll include in there, obviously, a link out to my SEO done for you services. I also offer an SEO boot camp. So for those of you out there that maybe, you know, can't afford that monthly done for you service, I have a six week SEO bootcamp that can really help you kind of get the train on the tracks with very clear, actionable instructions of what you can do yourself, right? Monthly tasks, things that you can do there. Okay. So I'll be linking to all that in the show notes again, tripodpodcast.com. Conversely, if someone is ready or wants to learn more, about SEM. Jill, how can they connect with you or or what services do do you offer? Yes. So if you want to learn about SEM, if you found this conversation really exciting and you're thinking, I want to do that for my business, then I would suggest you check out my course platform inside Google ads. You can access it via my website, jill.ca. That's J-Y-L-L.ca. And it's just $29 a month subscription, on-demand learning, everything you want to know about Google ads with actual in platform, here's how you do it. So that's the best way to learn about Google ads with me. Uh, And then if you did want some more personalized one-on-one support, I do offer Google ads and Google analytics coaching sessions. And again, you can learn about all of that at my website, jyll.ca. And I will say as a special treat for all of you here today, and a thank you for having me. Treat, treat, treat. Uh, You can use the coupon code tripod to get $5 off your first month of inside Google ads. So when you go there, just type in coupon code tripod at checkout and you'll get $5 off your first month of Google ads learning with me. Guys, all this will be in the show notes, tripodpodcast.com. Jill, thank you so much for being here. I learned so much. This is also why, as a very side note or, or closing remark, I, I think I told you when we first chatted, like I hate the word expert. I don't use it in anything that, because I, I feel like I'm a lifelong learner. And I'm going to tell you, digital marketing, like obviously I think many things, but digital marketing is something that is constantly evolving. And there is space enough in here for all of, I'll say most, maybe not all, because some, yeah, for most of uh, uh, us marketing coaches, to thrive and help people in a lot of different ways. So I was super stoked to have you really enjoyed our conversation. Again, links to everything we talked about. You can find it tripodpodcast.com. Jill, any closing remarks? That's it. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here to talk all things SEO, SEM, and hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks for listening to Tripod. Be sure to subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. For show notes and past episodes, go to tripodpodcast.com. Connect with Tricycle Creative on social media at Hello Tricycle and learn more about how we can help you with your marketing at tricycle-creative.com.